People are yearning for information. Having the opportunity to encourage people and to educate people and inspire people. It's amazing to be able to say we'll carve out time to take care of ourselves. There's something for everyone. Chicago-born and bred Chef John Mooney trained at the Kendall Culinary School. He has worked all over the world, including Texas, D.C., New York, India, and Ireland. He has received numerous awards, including recognition by the James Beard Foundation as one of the best hotel chefs in America. He is chef owner of Bell Book and Candle in New York and Bidwell in Washington, D.C. We met him at Bidwell through our friend, Representative Tim Ryan, and we love what he's doing in the world. Welcome, John, to Health Gig. Good to be here. Welcome, John. We're so happy you're here. Yes. So we have so many things we want to ask you about your amazing career, but we know you grew up in Chicago yes. and that you have been in the food business since you were 12. Right. So tell us about that. Growing up in Chicago, I um, grew up west of the city. Even since grade school, I went to school with quite a few kids that had families in the restaurant business. One girl that I'm still friends with, her father owned the diner across the street from our school, and that was a proper great diner. So that was kind of my first introduction. My father really loved the Chicago neighborhoods and all the different diversity we have there, and great options in, in every direction when it comes to different kinds of food. So that was my first exposure. I didn't really appreciate it too much until I ended up moving in my early 20s. But while I was there, I mean, we were pretty submerged in a lot of really good food. My mother's best friend was from Sweden. My family's Irish. So our repertoire wasn't huge in, in my home, but my mother's best friend being from Sweden, actually, sometimes I feel a little bad saying it, that Janet, my mother's best friend, had more to do with my culinary career than my own mother. And when it comes to the things you think about as a kid and eating in your home, because my mom's friend was always with us at all times. And we were having herring and pickled crayfish and Swedish meatballs and things like that. And there's a huge Swedish neighborhood in the north side of Chicago called Andersonville, which is all Swedes and Scandinavian, which you can get all those ingredients that not a lot of people are exposed to. So having those, I thought was pretty normal. And until I removed myself from Chicago, I didn't realize how special all those things were, but it started at a very young age. And then there's like steakhouses and French restaurants and pretty good Chinatown and Polish food and German food and Mexican <laughs> food, you know, so it just unlimited, you know. You know, I wanted to play football and kind of a high school hero in that respect. And then when I got to the level to go to the next level, I realized, okay, I need to shift gears here because I wasn't good enough. And the only experience I had was restaurants. I started at 12 years old in a family friend of my father, the Italian restaurant, and now dishwasher, those kinds of things. My brother was a pizza cook. My sister was a phone girl. So that was the only experience I had. So I went back to it and then was exposed to some professional environments. And then I decided that was my career at a very young age, which was better benefit to me my whole life. That's so fun that you guys all worked in the restaurant together. My father prescribed to the Midwest blue collar Irish family kind of thing. So if you weren't doing sports or having extracurricular activities, you had to work. My dad's friend owned an Italian restaurant that was really good food that we used to frequent and we all ended up working there. That's awesome. That's so, yeah, so it was neat. great. It was fun. It was fun. When did you go to culinary school then? I started working at the 95th floor of the Hancock building, which at the time I think was the third largest building in the world. Anyway, that was kind of interesting. And I got that job. I was working in a, another family friend's restaurant. If you're from Chicago, you probably know it, but it's like a steakhouse kind of family restaurant, but individually owned. That was kind of my first introduction to actual cooking. And then my brother was going to Loyola and a guy he went to school with, his older brother was the chef at the 95th floor. So my brother said, I should go speak to him. Maybe it's a little bit more of a, not just a job, but maybe a career. He's a proper chef kind of thing. And uh, that guy took me under his wing. And it was a really great kitchen because it was huge production of banquets and cooking to order all the French brigade system and full pastry shop and everything made from scratch and a huge production. So it was very intense in terms of like workload. He got exposed to everything, you know, wow. from, yeah, a whole cold kitchen, making all the salads and garmage and we call them in the restaurant world and then uh, catering, which would be the production side, you know, quantity food production. And then the finite things of cooking for a dining room that was a very expensive one paired with wine and all those things. So it was a really good environment to grow in and learn. In. And when I got into that environment, when I saw what it could be, 
I immediately knew that this was the place for me. A bunch of like-minded people, you know, kind of high energy, a little bit challenging pupils in school. <laughs> My teachers always said if John would apply himself, you know, he'd be probably the top of his class or whatever. But I was spending most of my time looking out the window thinking what else I could possibly do than be in, <laughs> be, be in this room. And, exactly. Uh, when I got to the professional kitchen, I was surrounded by 20 other guys just like me. That's awesome. And so then the owner, I got a grant, which helped me with my financial aid. And then I decided to go to culinary school because I didn't take my earlier school so, so seriously that I had a little bit that I wanted to prove. And I also thought it would be a good foundation, but I knew that I was getting a great on the job education. I could have done without the culinary school. I was in a great place, but I did it for some personal reasons and it was beneficial to me. Um, and it was right there in Evanston, right across the street from Northwestern's campus at the time called Kendall. And it was a hotel restaurant management, culinary art and native American art school. Wow. Wow. Interesting. (laughs) Pretty good combination of interesting kids going there. Yeah. So speaking of learning outside of culinary school, you then went on to work all over the world. I know that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That you were in Texas, D.C., New York, India, Ireland, and on and on. Tell us about that experience and really who were your mentors then? I know your mom's friend was a big mentor, Yeah, yeah. but who were some of the chefs you worked with and what did you learn from them? My first real chef was a gentleman named Jack Kennedy. He came from the Irish family, which we both, I could relate to. He was about 10 years older than me, well-established in the industry, but his father was a head brain surgeon at Loyola Hospital. So he had a very interesting family dynamic, somewhat of a black sheep, His parents probably wanted him to be a doctor, lawyer, those kinds of things. He really helped me understand the ins and outs of leadership and what it actually takes some dedication of physical effort and knowledge. And it's not just a backbone, but there's also an education to it and all those kinds of things like reference books and different kinds of continents and food and things. So that was a great exposure. And then from there, he actually helped me get a job with a very well-known Basque chef named Gubino Sondolino who I believe is still alive, and I think he's well into his 80s now. Wow. And he was partners with Rich Melman at Let Us Entertain You, and I worked for his four-star restaurant called Ambria. Through Ambria, I met a guy who went to my culinary school who was working in Dallas, Texas, at the mansion on Turtle Creek. He said to me, if you think that we're doing interesting things in Chicago, you should see this place down in Dallas. So I sent my resume. And I got an entry-level job, a call me chef, bottom guy in the kitchen, you know, the lowest level culinarian. And I moved down there and I took my best friend, Jose Garces, with me, who now owns probably 30 restaurants. And Jose went to culinary school with me. So Jose had a truck and I had a job and we moved to Dallas, Texas. And neither of us have ever moved back. Then I worked for Chef Dean Ferry. And Dean, to this day, is still a great mentor and a person I could call at any time and ask for advice. But in his kitchen, I really thought that I was like going to walk in there and maybe contribute when I realized very quickly that, no, I'm there to learn. The humbling experiences were some of the most beneficial. It was like a situation where, okay, you master pasta cookery and then you master like poaching eggs or whatever the case may be. And then a year goes by and it gets to the point where they're like, your shoes need to be polished, your apron needs to be ironed, and those kinds of things. That discipline that you carry with you the rest of your career. So I really appreciate that. And I've been able to use it as a reference and a resource my whole entire career. But from there, I left with a couple guys and I went to work in Washington, D.C. for Mark Miller and ended up doing some openings for him. And I learned some Asian fundamentals working for Chef Dean, but Mark Miller is a professor of anthropology at Berkeley, a very, very well-educated and well-traveled chef and restaurant guy. Mark also has been a nonstop resource, like a father to me my whole entire career. Through him, I really learned like, okay, it's limitless. You can always do better. A bunch of things he likes to say is we don't follow trends. We sat down to be an industry leader. There's a bunch of responsibility that goes along with that. And he preached fiduciary responsibility, not just art and talent, which a lot of the chefs that I find don't have. 
those fundamental things as a young person, I mean, I could go on forever, but those fundamental things that as a young person really, really helped me. Kind of set the path for where you were going to go, it sounds like. And you really were lucky to meet these mentors that took such an interest in you and helped develop what you are today. Dora, you were talking to me today about how Chef John talked about what he discovered about food. What was it that you were asking? What's wrong with the way that we eat? What did you discover about food? And how did you get into the sustainable business that you're in now? That's the next level. So I went to New York with guys, obviously, that I worked in D.C. with. And through Mark Miller, a couple of us, and my current business partner, who's been my business partner for like, I don't know, close to 20 years now. We all went up to New York. I was doing a birthday party for David Rockwell who's a famous designer of hotels and big buildings in New York. And he's a pretty well-known guy. It was his 40th birthday. And I was the chef. And I met Drew Dinkper as a guest there. And he asked me like uh, about my background. And I told him I worked for Gabino and I worked for Dean and I worked for Mark Miller. And then he goes, well, why don't you do that stuff up here? And I told him, well, I was cooking a lot of Southwest food. And at the time I was working for a gentleman named Peter Glazier that wanted me to do a bunch of steakhouses for him, but I didn't want to do that. I felt I wanted to do something more cutting edge, more interesting. And I felt that that was kind of backwards for me coming from Chicago. So anyway, he explained to me that he was focusing on health and wellness and that it was for personal reasons and that. He had been doing a bunch of different kinds of restaurants. He loves French food, got three stars and loads of accolades. Then I saw a totally different level. And it was in the Battle of Benton thing where we were kind of like trying to break into something new. You know, that was like 1997, 98. And then coming up with this point, it's just been a constant evolution from that. I like to do openings. There are always lots of things to match up and learn from. As he would describe it, under his tutelage, we have the benefit of messing up on his wallet on his star. And that, <laughs> that's where I learned doing openings for him. I eventually got to the point where I was confident enough to do my own restaurants. Yeah, it's just been a whole evolution, yeah. It's incredible. But how did you get into the rooftop farming? And can you tell everybody about what that is? And is it at your current restaurants now? Yeah. Before Velvet Beef Handle, I owned a restaurant in Orlando. It's called Island Manor, which is still there. It's a Queen Anne-style Victorian home, giant one, sitting on 22 acres from land. Big wedding venue. It was a turnkey operation, so we had, you know, that whole structure, a full kitchen and things like that. And we kind of got it for a song because it had been previously mismanaged or whatever had happened. Anyway, we thought it was a good opportunity for us, and it was. We had the mortgage crisis in 08 and 09. And us being city boys from places like New York and Chicago, we didn't know that other parts of the nation get affected the way they do. You know, for instance, we had a house in the cul-de-sac. And by the time we actually sold the place to move back up to New York, it was us and one other person that lived at the 13th home cul-de-sac. It was that bad. We were a little bit sentimentally attached to that property. It was beautiful. We put a lot of work into it. It was working for us. And then... All of a sudden, overnight, massive yeah. decline in business and no disposable income, a huge overhead. Wow. And uh, thankfully, my father told me, I'm not going to watch you guys wreck the rest of your lives, holding debt to this place, running yourselves into the ground. He's like, you're too young for that. You're sentimentally, you're emotionally attached to this place, but you need, we need to, to find a buyer. And we did. We found a wow. buyer. He still owns it, still runs it, same name and everything that we had. So we That's definitely great. had something. We just did not have the financial fortitude to weather that storm. So when you made that move, is that when you started doing the rooftop farming and the hydroponics? No, and I was growing on the land on that property. Soil in Florida is very sandy and very moist. It's really conducive to bugs and pests, lots of bacteria, lots of molds and all kinds of stuff. It's very difficult to grow there. Most people use the sunlight, which is very beneficial. But the soil is poor, so there's a lot of indoor growing. I started outdoor growing. I met the guy who created the system I used randomly at a farmer's market. Tell us what hydroponics is, how it works, what are the benefits of it, what are the downsides, if any. Want to hear the real story? Yes. All right, so while I was in culinary school, I had some of thoughts of vertical growing system. At that time, I started to grow marijuana. 
<laughs> you know? Okay. okay. <laughs> Which is not a big deal now, but then it was a big deal. Yeah. And I preached the benefits of it and growing in and all that to my family. And they were like, shut up about it. But 20 years <laughs> later, I was a big, I told me so at family events. Okay? <laughs> anyway, my first introduction was that. So I had known a lot about the nutrients, the vertical growing, the requirements to grow a plant indoors or supplement with indoor light or all that kind of stuff. So I had had success growing vertically with a similar system and it just <laughs> randomly happened. And I had the conversation with the guy and I said, I know exactly what you're talking about. But at that point, I used the application to do all the vegetables I could that don't need to grow like tubes and roots, onions and potatoes and things that grow in soil. I could grow all my herbs tomatoes, all my vines, like watermelons, all the things. So that's what we did. So we tested it originally, converting from a real conventional garden to an aeroponic garden. And then all the benefits that come, less than 10% water required. And 3,000 square foot, I could grow the same amount of vegetables that a four acre farm could grow. Wow. Um, using less than 10% of the water. And, and then, you recycle the water, right? Yeah. So there's no evaporation there, no runoff. Uh, no contamination. We suspend our own nutrients. We release our own beneficial insects, like aphids, for instance, you release ladybug. So we don't use any pesticide. We can control that. We don't need any trucks to transport. So things like tomatoes never see a refrigerator. Herbs get put the day of. Lettuces get pulled as a whole wow. head with their roots attached. And those can stay dormant in the refrigerator for up to six weeks. Isn't the criticism often that it doesn't grow in the soil, so it doesn't get its nutrients? What do you say to that? Well, in the wine world, there's a thing called terroir, which is like what the brick is get from the earth. And there, there is some minerality to that. But on the other hand, that's never been proven. And also, vegetables take what they need. So if you have a liquid composition that's modeled after a solid composition, it's the exact same thing. The only thing that's different is there's no resistance for them to pull their nutrients, so they actually grow about 20 to 40% quicker than a wow. than 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 rate of crop. If I plant a head of lettuce from seed to actual consumption, I can do that four weeks to six weeks. So if you grow it from seed in water, how does that work? Okay, you germinate seeds just like you would anything. You give them a moist, warm environment, let them sprout. We have a uh, natural substance that's spun silicon. It's spun rock, uh, like lava rock kind of substance called so rock. So on wool. top it, of the restaurant in D.C., you've got this garden? Oh, yeah. Wow. And is and that in yeah. New York. And, and in, New, in York. New York. Yeah. And I had a superfood farm in Hawaii until February of 2019. I sold that. Oh, wow. But that, that was orchard grow and all different kinds of just superfoods, though. But that was conventional growing up. In your gardens in D.C. and New York, you grow vegetables, and I know you can't grow fruits that come on trees, but what about other fruit? Can you grow Yeah, that? I grow tremendous strawberries. Oh, I bet they're great. Strawberries yeah. are a very interesting plant. There's so many ways to yield. And so strawberries that normally grow on the ground, they sit. They sit on the ground, so they Get usually mold. have like a melon. They all have a little brown spot, a little soft spot yeah, where they sit. Yeah, yeah. So melons, they still sit, but we rotate them. And then strawberries hang. So our strawberries are perfect every time. How does that all work? All the staff members help. We always keep one attendant, which usually spends about two to three hours a day. But what it does for the staff, when they see and learn and touch the food that we prepare, it creates a really great sense of pride in the food program. You know, in New York, you have to walk up six flights to get up there. And nobody ever complains once they see the garden. Nobody's ever in a rush to get out of there. It definitely has all positive vibes for anybody that comes in interaction with it. So cool. Tell Trisha how you transport the vegetables from the rooftop in New York. We have a hoist that we built and we drop it right down to the back door and like a farmer's basket. <laughs> do you ever run out of vegetables and fruits? So like, and then if you do, what do you do? We supplement. We try to support our local farmer's market. But like I grow enough cucumbers to pickle for the hamburgers and the bar and everything that I never have to purchase a cucumber. Tomatoes, we grow so many because we love them and we grow so many varieties that, yeah, we'll can those. Abundance of herbs, we'll dry and use them in other applications, things like that. So you learn to preserve. But when we do run out, yeah, we do have to purchase and we do have to supplement. But we try to do that locally. 
you know, certain crops aren't really beneficial to grow in our small areas because they don't yield a lot. So I grew beans and like green beans or chickpeas and things like that. Those are all really cool, but they don't make sense for us because you need a ton of space like grow soybeans to grow a quantity that you would use right. in the restaurant. Yeah. Because you grow these beautiful vegetables, have you ever thought of going plant-based? And also, where do you get your meats and things? I've never thought of going plant-based because I believe in omnivorous consumption. And I don't like the misnomers of the beef industry in particular, because when it comes to an actual commodity crop, nothing makes more sense than beef for whatever reasons. You know, there's a lot of industrialization and all those things we could go on forever about. But when it comes to water consumption and what the give back is to the land, cattle is one of the best things you could raise anywhere if it's done right. And one of the references I will say is living in Ireland, they've been doing it that way for thousands of years. And they have very little issues on that island when it comes to raising enough food. It's the number one export, actually, it's like tree, so it's not self-sustaining, it's an export, which is bigger than tourism for Ireland, which is great. But one thing I learned from India is there's so much diversity when it comes to the food culture there that I designed my dishes, for instance. We might add chorizo and goat cheese to a uh, pinto bean if we make at Bidwell, but that's as a foundation, it's, it's vegan. So if you don't want the meat or the cheese, you could have a vegan version and then they're topped with like herbs from the garden, shallots and cherry tomatoes, things like that. We design dishes to be able to be manipulated for a vegan or vegetarian diet, gluten-free and all those things. So we keep everything in mind. And where do you get your meat? I have a few different sources. For my beef, I have cows raised in Greenwich, New York. Chad Lutz's friend went to college with the guy whose family has a cattle farm up there. So they grow Angus for us. We do some pretty cool things there. So we do um, half a cow every two weeks. So it's one cow a month and we manage it so that the prime cuts are specials and the secondary cuts are grinds and raises and all the other stuff. So we can use a whole cow and rapidly decrease our kill. For instance, if you have beef tenderloin, say you go to a wedding and it's beef or salmon, it's the choice of beef tenderloin or horseshoe and salmon. You know, there's only maybe 16 to 18 portions of tenderloin in one whole cow. So in order to get enough for 100 people, it's a pretty extreme amount. Everything else gets used in different ways. That's a pretty good way we figured it out there where we only kill 12 cows a year. Lamb comes from Gap, Pennsylvania. Chickens come from Pennsylvania, too. Those are raised on one farm. Our turkeys come from there, too. And those are pasture-raised, grain-fed, goat or venison. We do venison chili. Those things I have actually shipped from Hawaii or in season, I can get them locally here, like in Virginia or Pennsylvania is a good one too. When we first met you with Congressman Tim Ryan, I remember they described you as sort of really out front in all of this, that you were one of the leaders, you know, and now look at you, you're still leading the way in this sustainable restaurant and all that. Yeah, there's two sides to that. Some people really take it as their life's mission and really try to like what I'd say, beat their guests over the head with it and make everybody come and like prescribe to what I believe or my staff to prescribe to what I believe. I don't do that. I believe that it, it means something to me. It's my life. Some of the kids that work for me are college students that go and do all kinds of other things in the world. And that's one of the beauties of the restaurant business because it supports almost all other industries and arts. But my restaurant is the place you can go for a birthday, an anniversary, an engagement, all these kinds of things. And you're not going to feel like you have to be part of my crew or something. I want you to come for all the other reasons that anybody goes out. But I want you to know that we have something we believe in and we're trying to give the highest quality for the best value. And that roots us in our neighborhoods that we put our restaurants and we've done very well with that. You've gotten so many accolades that you don't really talk about very much, but it's incredible all the recognition that you've gotten. It never meant a lot to me. I never did it for money. I uh, fortunately have been able to travel the world and do anything I ever wanted. I still feel like I wanted to get up and get in there. And I tell everybody I've never had a job, but I've only had a lifestyle. But I feel fortunate as a young person that really didn't have a whole lot of direction to fall into something that I've made a life out of. 
I don't know how anybody could go to work and not really dedicate a lot of time or focus to anything if you really don't care about it. There's lots of ways to make money. Very few ways that you could do something that you love, you know, like to be a musician or chefs are artists. So it's a tough business, but you have to love it or kind of a waste of time. And you obviously do. Yes, it's contagious, your enthusiasm. I know that Your rooftop garden in D.C. is the only restaurant that has a rooftop garden. And I read that New York has 28,000 restaurants or something. Are there any other guys like you in New York doing rooftop gardens? Well, yeah, that's interesting because Elbuck and Candle will be 14 years old at the end of this year. In the beginning, it was me and one more forward guy named Ben Flanner that owns Brooklyn Grange. He and I were the first ones doing rooftop stuff, the two totally different applications. And from there, Ben's pushed really hard. And that's what he really devotes himself to is really trying to convert warehouse space, dead space into this light soil where they grow conventionally. But since the beginning, there has been loads and loads of green designs, rooftop gardens all over the nation, but in New York alone. There's tons of rooftop spaces, even right down the street for me, Rosemary's grows some stuff. They don't have a huge production, but at least they have a green roof. What a green roof gives you is living matter on your roof that also helps with your heating and cooling because you have all those plants up there, as opposed to a normal hundred year old New York building that has a foot of tar on the roof. Uh, right, yeah. right. Yeah. I tell everybody, or like, what about my little tiny shoebox apartment on 60th Street? Well, if you want to start, grow some herbs in your windowsill. Use them when you cook. That alone, it betters everybody. The name of your restaurant in New York is Bell, Book, and Candle. What does that mean? It's a famous movie called uh, Bell, Book, and Candle. It's with Tim Novak and Jimmy Stewart, set in the West Village where my restaurant is. So it's got a bunch of scenes, really cool scenes of the West Village in the winter, that kind of charm that I think people still go down to the village for all that 50s inspiration of music and literary stuff and that vibe, that feel. And I don't know how much you've traveled in Ireland, but my partner is from Dublin. We're both 100% Irish. And the actual bell booking candle process is a casting out of the Catholic religion. Oh. It's a discommunication and us being two Irish Catholic boys that are a little bit alternative thinkers, we can relate <laughs> to that too. So uh, the funny thing about Bell Booking Candle is there's a bunch of people for loads of different reasons that know about the Kim Novak and Jimmy Stewart movie, or they know about the Broadway play. There was a cat in the movie called Pie Wicket. <laughs> and people respond to that a lot. So that, so that cat got a lot of attention, but people send us things all the time and it's become a collection. So we have all these like <laughs> vintage and rare books that we put on the shelves. We have bells coming from all over. We actually <laughs> got a signed picture from Kim Novak herself. Wow. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's <laughs> neat. What about Bidwell? Why did you name your restaurant in D.C. at Union Market Bidwell? Well, see, the food programs are obviously very similar. The only thing that changes is some regional stuff like the seafood and things like that. Some of the dishes overlap as well, signatures. But Bidwell, I was researching seeds to grow in this region. Now, they're similar. D.C. has a little bit of a less mild winter, and it has a little bit more humidity. Summers in New York are rough, but D.C. is kind of extreme. Anyway, I was researching some plants that would grow well in this climate, and I came across a gentleman, General John Bidwell, who was a very interesting person, and we didn't want to do a bell-looking candle down here because Bubble King Candle was designed for the West Village. We didn't feel it would translate. So we figured we'd stick with the same philosophy, but let's do something different. John Bidwell started Gold Metal Flour. Anybody who's ever oh. baked a cake or fried chicken probably purchased Gold Metal Flour. He was one of the first people who started the National Seed Bank so we wouldn't run out of food in, in rough times when disease can get a hold of crops. He was a general in the Mexican-American War, was huge on human rights as well. He traversed the nation, and I think it was something like 20-something people in his group, and only six of them survived. Oh, um, wow. I was like, well, that's some pretty cool roots, and it's <laughs> definitely connected to like some history and food in America. And I thought Bidwell had some positive connotations, so I bounced it off some people, and they're like, yeah, the logo looks like 
a doily, like you would put a glass of water on in any restaurant, but it's actually a big well melon cut in half. Oh, you're kidding. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I did not know that. Bid well, wow. Yeah. You can have a ton of money and design a restaurant and have some kind of theme, but there's no proven formula. So we like to attach ourselves to some kind of history, some kind of roots to give us some like backbone. Gosh, John, you are fascinating. I mean, yes, fascinating. We knew that you're an awesome chef, but we didn't know all this, you know? <laughs> Thanks for all the efforts that you're doing in sustainability. I, Dora and I just really applaud that. Yes. And I um, think it's amazing. And your restaurant is unbelievable. We haven't been to Bell Book and Candle, but plan to come, right, Dora? Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah. And those uh, listeners from D.C. need to get down to Union Market to Bidwell. It's wonderful. Yeah. Thank you, John. Thanks so John. much. Thank you very much. I appreciate you having me on. Thank you for joining us on Health Gig. We loved having you with us. We hope you'll tune in again next week. In the meantime, be sure to like and subscribe to this podcast and follow us on healthgigpod.com. I'm Trisha. And I'm Doro. Be well.